And it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Manos Berlakis, who, uh, first of all, is exceptionally uh, uh, burdened this week, picking up, uh, you know, where someone else was, was hurt in Dallas, and so he's really under a crunch. So, it, Manos, it's, it's great of you to come down, and, you know, even though you, you got uh, probably a miserable week. So if you don't know Dr. Berlakis by name, he's uh, uh, probably the world expert on CTO PCI. And I say that seriously. Uh, a lot of people talk about it. A lot of people uh, do CTOs. Manos is the guy who does this systematically, uh, does it scientifically, investigates it, teaches it, and probably most important, uh, do we need new watch batteries, Dr. Bimraj? Uh, most important teaches us to think about it. So really, if there's anyone in the world I want to hear talk to me about CTOs, it's Dr. Balakis. So, uh, Manos, come on up here. The other thing I'll tell you is Woody Allen used to joke that he and God were really close. They bought their suits together. Uh, Dr. Balakis and I travel internationally and buy our suits together, too. <laughs> <laughs> All yours. Great. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, it's a great pleasure to be here today. I want to like thank Dr. Kleinman for the um, kind invitation. And it is true, actually, it's his fault I got the suit because he got the shirt first. And then I felt jealous, so I went and got the suit. So it happened in three days, so the result you know, happens quickly. There's a matter with the optimal, but it works. So it's uh, about um, current total occlusion. It's an area that you were asking me earlier what it is. And in my opinion, it is the most exciting area of intervention. I'm biased, obviously. These are my disclosures. And the reason I think it's very exciting, and I'll try to go over it in the next few minutes, is um, because it's something that's been going on for a long time. CTOs have been around for a long time, but for until now we had very limited tools how to approach these lesions. You can see this is from the largest series in Canada. About 18%, one in five patients is going to have a CTO. If you look at the Dallas VA, actually if you have a, a bypass, it's going to be 89%. If you don't have a bypass, it's going to be one in three. So it's something you see every, every day in the cath lab. And obviously not everything needs to be open, but many of those need to be open. This is from my son's birthday party a few months ago. And this is a, a rock climbing gym. And this is very interesting because that's how people look at CTOs right now. Some people are very excited. Some others are not that sure. And that's very true because some people are really embraced it. They want to work on it. They, um, they believe in the, in the CTO PCI and the value and the success. But others are not so sure or they're even scared. So here's some data. As Dr. Kleinman mentioned, we need some data to see where we are, what we need to do, and where we need to go. And this is from a registry we put together a few years ago. It's called the Progress CTO Registry. It has 23 sites right now and growing. We got our first international site in Russia last week, so we're very excited about that. And these are the results as of a couple of months ago. In uh, um, more than 1,000 lesions, success is 91%, complications 1.7%. And if you see here, the, the different techniques you have to use to get to these numbers are all 3D approaches, both undergrade, dissection, and entry, and retrograde. I'll go over this in more detail in a few minutes. But you need all of those techniques to get to this higher level success rate. And that's true even if you have previous bypass. So by previous bypass patients had a 10% gap. The penalty for having bypass, things are much harder, much more calcification. You don't have as good collaterals. But lately, we're able to bridge to a large extent this gap, getting to the 90% mark, even for those previous bypass patients. Instant stenosis used to be thought as a complex and challenging group. Still, you can get to this level of 90% or so, even in instant stenosis lesion. And if you're doing a CTO course and you don't like the visiting operator, you give them a circumflex CTO because you have a 10% less success than for the LADs for many reasons. Part of it is that the tortuosity, and because it's on the lateral wall, you don't have any septal collaterals, it's mainly epicardial collaterals that are harder and more risky as well. But even for those lesions, you get close to the 90% mark. This is from Aaron Grantham from Mid-America, the Open CTO Registry. This is a, a adjudicated registry, 1,000 consecutive patients done in 12 sites in the United States, very similar to progress in terms of demographics. 60% are right coronary CTOs and uh, 30 millimeters is the length, and success is about the same. So 89% technical success rate. How long it takes? About two hours. 2.5 grays of radiation, and 265 mLs of contrast. 
This is from the UK, so not just in the US, but if you go outside the US, this is from um, the UK and 10 of the um, highest volume centers, more than 2,000 CTOs, they also get to this 90% success rate. It may take sometimes a second attempt, that's what's called an investment. You cannot cross the lesion initially and then you balloon it and you come back and sometimes you see the vessel nicely open and it takes 10 minutes to stand it. And that was the capital investment. Of course, investment can be good or bad, right? So we're hoping for the good investments here. But if you go out of these centers that are do this on a routine basis and are very experienced doing these procedures and go to NCDR and look at the overall US population, the picture is a little different. So this is from NCDR, this is from uh, 2009, 2013, and the percent of CTO PCI among stable PCI was about 3.8%, and over time, it has been growing. So it was 3% or so in 2009, and 2013, it went up to almost 5%, and I think if you look at it now, it will probably be even higher than that. But the success still was fairly low, started at the mid-50s and went to 61%, so that's a 30-point difference compared to what can be achieved is actually currently being achieved in Expedia Center. So the point here is that although CTO PCI can be done with high success in Expedia Centers, it is not quite the same picture if you take the whole US population as a whole. And you see here success is overall 59%, markedly less than non-CTO. And complications are twice as high. And we'll get back to that because there's no question complications are higher with CTO PCI. And, uh, you have to understand which complications happen and how can we prevent them. And these are the complications, more tamponade, more urgent coronary bypass, sl uh, slightly more mortality, urgent um, bypass, same stroke, and more myocardial infarction. So CTO PCI does carry a penalty in terms of complications. And also, as all of you may know, it takes a little longer, or sometimes a lot longer, depending on the case. So the overall contrast was more, and the fluoroscopy time was more. So there's a gap. There's a gap. What can be done and what is currently done? And how can we get everyone to get to the same level? Is it about the equipment? Is it about the equipment we have? Maybe those people who got less success maybe didn't have the right equipment. And there's no question we had tremendous developments in the last few years in terms of what we have. This is an example. These are the Gaia guide wires. This is a new kind of guide wires with what's called a composite core. What it means is essentially two coils at the tip, which means that if you turn it back here, it transmits almost one-to-one -one on the back end, and you can actually direct the wire very effectively, much more precisely than you could before. comes in three flavors with increasing stiffness. And this is one of the cases that made me believe of this. That was a case um, failed twice in another institution, RCA, instant stenosis, flash occlusion. And um, we had to go retrograde from the lima, went down epicardial, up the right. But then we got over here, and by the time the wire reached this point, it will move. Any wire got in, the wire got frozen. It was so many turns and twists, the wire was stuck. And the only wire that actually made it was the guy. So the guy was able to come all the way to here and still be able to penetrate and uh, go all the way through. And we do have other wires right now, like these two wires, RJ3, R350, which are long wires for what's called externalization. Wire comes from one access point, goes through the heart, collateral, through the CTO, comes out from another access point. It's a very... Good feeling when that happens, gives you very good success, but obviously requires the right equipment. And it worked in this particular case, so after multiple balloons and a lot of, a lot of work, um, the, the vessel was recanalized. We have other devices, like the crossbow device, which is a, a blunt tip, atraumatic catheter that will spin very fast, that is particularly effective for instant stenosis CTOs. This is actually a study we just started and we're randomizing uh, to cross boss and wire escalation, trying to understand in which subgroups of patients using this catheter works best than using a standard wire escalation. This is the Stingray balloon, which helps us get back in the true lumen if your wire, by accident or intentionally, goes in what's called the subintimal space, goes below the, the lumen or where the lumen used to be of the vessel, and then it has two exit ports and let you essentially puncture back into the true lumen of the vessel. There are devices to give you more support, like this device called the Prodigy, which has a balloon, it's like the old Proxys device, has a balloon and anchors you, gives you extra support to cross. And there are other devices like this called the Center Cross and Multicross that have a metal mass, a nitinol mass, that go against the vessel wall, and what they do is they give you, again, support to be able to push harder to get through the occlusion. We have some very new microcatheters that came out actually in the last, um, within the last few months to the last year, 
like the Caravel and the Turnpike, which are much thinner than the previous ones and have a polymer. So they go places that we weren't able to go, and the main use for them is for lasers where the balloon, the wire goes, the balloon does not, or going through these very, very tortuous small epicardial collaterals that other microcatheters cannot get through. Or is it about the mind? Is it the equipment or is it the mind of people, the mindset? And there's no question that a lot of mental skills go into doing those cases. And there are many techniques currently available, as I showed you earlier on, that are the traditional undergrade, meaning with poking the wire on the front end of the occlusion, going on the back end, or going intentionally in the subintimal space and trying to cross through. And this is the illustration. So again, you have the occlusion. The classic way is guide, microcatheter, wire, trying to go through this direction. Retrograde means go from a collateral all the way on the back end and try to come back and puncture back from the distal lumen to the proximal lumen. And the dissection reentry is you go around the lesion, the subintimal space, go around it, and then use equipment like this, the stingray balloon, to get back in and to recanalize the vessel. So there is this technique called the hybrid, which, as you know, every week, every word is Greek, and that's no exception for the word hybrid. And that means it's an offspring of crossbreeding. And this is the more elaborate way, which is to say that we try to open the vessel using all techniques in the most safe, effective, and efficient way. We're going to get the artery open quickly, safely, and successfully. And this is how it started. So this is more than a little more than five years ago in um, Bill Lombardi's lab, which is um, at the time in Bellingham, a small city in uh, Seattle, in Washington State. And about 15 people got in a room, many people you recognize that uh, discussed every single case and then put an algorithm on a, on, a, on a paper and say, okay, for this case, we're going to do this approach. And then the case was done, 17 cases done in three days, all successful to have a uh, perforation. And based on this, what came is this, which is the algorithm, trying to find a common way, kind of a broad picture of how to approach those lesions. And this is called the hybrid algorithm. And what it starts with is the dual injection. In my mind, the most important thing for getting success and safety in CTOPCI is not the fancy stuff and the cool equipment and the fancy techniques. It's actually the basics. And the number one basic is the dual injection. Sounds very simple, but I can tell you, having gone to many labs, there's a lot of resistance to people putting a second guide catheter in. It's just not what we do in every day, and there's a lot of mental barriers trying to do that. And the reality is, by not doing that, you automatically decrease your success rate and increase your complication rate, because the reason for having this dual injection is, if your wire goes somewhere, you want to know where that somewhere is, and by doing the contralateral injection, you can actually say, okay, the wire is completely out, I need to reposition it. If you don't know that, then bad things can happen. So simple things are, uh, first. Dual injection is the one simple thing. The second simple thing is always using an over-the-wire system. Many people like to just get a wire, like we do for regular PCI, go in and try to find your way around. That's not the way to do it for many reasons, because you have less control of the wire, less penetrating force, but also because if you're going to change, that's a problem. So those two things, dual, dual injection over the wire system, that will give you a lot of increase in your success and, and efficiency as well. And then we'll look at four things, where it starts, how is the lethal vessel, do you have any collateral vessels, and how long is the lesion. And based on this, we we'll try to decide what is the first way to go. But the most important thing of this, I think, is the switch. In the past, we used to say, OK, I'm going to try this undergrade and spend the next three hours and seven gray and 600 of contrast try to go undergrade. Didn't work, we didn't change. The current philosophy is you try this, and then if it doesn't work within a reasonable period of time, then you do something else, because you never know what exactly is going to work in every single case. This is an example, right coronary artery CTO, a little ambiguous proximal cap. You see the patient has a nice, uh, a nice distal vessel. And uh, uh, this patient, there's an old stand in the distal right coronary artery. So fairly long occlusion, looks um, a little complicated. There are some collateral from the LAD, looked fairly promising for the retrograde approach. So we tried different. The first thing we tried here, based on the ambiguity of the proximal cap, is let's go retrograde and see if that can help us. But unfortunately, after we tried for several minutes, we just were not able to get through this to this collateral. 
So no problem, we try to understand where the lesion starts. And a view that is very, very useful for the right is this lateral view, which the arms go above the head, and then you take a look on the lateral. And sometimes you can actually decipher exactly where these are happening. But here, it's a little tough to tell. There's so many little branches coming off. It's really hard to say where the lesion is starting. So the solution to this problem, it's a technique called um, scratch and go, which is one of those you know, idioms for CTOPCI, where you create intentional dissection up here, and then you follow the dissection pathway using an anchor balloon over here, a little dissection you can see. And then what you do is you advance the knuckle wire, because what we've learned over time is that advancing a loop of a wire is more likely to follow the path of the vessel rather than going outside the vessel, which is what we don't want to happen. And sure enough, that, that's what happened over here. And it was going very nice, and we were very happy until it hit the old stand. And then it stopped going. And so that was another problem. Finally, we were able to redirect it. And um, another very important component of CTOPCI is you have to be um, efficient and try to, I guess, adjust adversity. If the PowerPoint shuts down, you have to try again. Don't give up. You just have to try again. OK, well, there you go. OK. See, CTOPCI is good for every part of life. And then finally, you see we're able to go around it, and around it, got to the side. The wire is going the wrong direction. Use the guy wire to go back again. So it was a little elaborate, as you can imagine. Finally, got close to where we need to be. Couldn't deliver anything around it, so used a balloon called Threader that was able to make a channel all the way down there. And then this is an algorithm. And I think CTO PCI, as every, every PCI, is a composite of algorithms. There is a finite number of problems. And you're going to have an approach that you thought about it before you go in the case. Because while you're in the case, things can heat it up, and you may not be able to think clearly and do this. So. This is our algorithm for, for the balloon uncrossable CTO, what I mentioned before, where the wire goes, but the balloon doesn't go. So what do you do? Many, many things you can do. You start with simple things, small balloons, the threader, glider. We do what's called the grenadoplasty. Get a small balloon, 1.5, not a 4.0, 1.5 balloon, break it. You, you're laughing, but I've heard some stories. Break it, and then, and then that modifies the vessel. We never had, we published this actually a few months ago, we never had a problem rupturing a 1.5 balloon. But if you rupture a 4.0 balloon, there's no results guaranteed. And then um, you move on to other, other, other techniques like increasing the support or using different devices. Laser is very useful for this. And if everything else fails, you go subindimal and try to modify the plug from the outside. So these are many different things, but it really helps you. When this happens to you, you have a, a plan of action and you can execute on it until something um, works. And finally, we're able to get the stingray balloon all the way down. We're doing what's called a double stick and swap, essentially trying to go, you see those little dots. We're trying to go um, on the side of those two little dots. And after what's called the double stick and swap, we're able to put a wire down in the vessel. Now, are we in the vessel? That's how we called it, double blind stick and swap. We're not completely blind, but in a way, we're trying to um, to minimize the contrast and fluoro time. The, the very important thing on CTOs is when you think you are somewhere, don't do anything until you confirm you are where you think you are. And to confirm, you need two, two, two projections, orthogonal projections. So here, this projection looks good. The wire seems to be in the posterior descending artery. But we do an RAO of you as well. And the wire also is in the posterior descending artery. So now we're feeling much better. We're good. And then we stand it. And it's actually interesting, this one. We, we found out that if you go around the stand, as you see here, it's actually okay to go around and crush the stand. And the increasing case reports that the new stand stays open. You see the old stand sitting over here. And then after we put the, after we put the stands, um, so got a nice result, got the vessel recanalized. And then after we do the stand, now you can see the old stand is crushed and is outside the, the new stand right over here. So anyway, so this is just obviously a complex case but illustrates many of the different things that need to be done to be successful in some of those, of those cases. So how can you get up there? How can you start a CTO program and get successful at doing this? 
And there's this uh, two and a half minute TED talk from Richards and John about what leads to success. So about CTO, but applies very nicely to CTO PCI. And he breaks it down to eight components. So the first one is a passion. Those procedures, as you may have gleaned already, are a little more different than the usual procedures. Sometimes they get long, sometimes they fail. And you, people who do this, you have to really believe in it and have a passion for it. This is not something you do once a month and you hope that things will go well. It's something you invest the time. And how do you know that that's for you? Is you do it a few times and, and you realize that's something you're excited, fascinated, or something you absolutely hate and don't want to have anything to do with. Second is you work. As you may know, Malcolm Gladwell says you 10,000 hours. It's a long time, but I have good news for you. So it turns out 10,000 hours is to become a world-class expert in something. But to get decent at something, you need 20 hours. So it sounds much more appealing now. So based on Josh Kaufman, 20 hours, if you really pay attention and get the basics, you get pretty decent at it. So we haven't validated this yet in CTO, by the way, but, but we're working on it. Studying, you need to, there are many resources right now. There are books, there are websites to share cases, there are webcasts. Um, for all of you who have a lot of free time, next week we have actually a webcast with Dr. Carlino, one of the uh, Italian experts device the, the technique with his own name, the Carlino technique. And of course, there are many journals, and they used to be a little more um, resistant to CTO. I think in the last few years, we've seen a lot more proliferation of articles and techniques and, and, and global thinking on how to approach them more effectively in all the major journals. Many meetings are going on. The next one is the CTO Club in, in Japan. And there's a lot of proctoring, so helping people get through. And this is why proctoring is good. This is me a couple of months ago in Utah. Um, I'm not a very good skier. And you know, when you crash like this, it's always nice to have someone come to you and try to help you get up because it can take a long time and a lot of stress to do that. The other lesson here is don't go to the blue slopes until you feel good at the green ones. But anyway, and you know, of course, there's, uh, uh, there's uh, not as many people to go around and do this. But as you know, Google Glass and now the new VR techniques are slowly improving. And we did a small study a few months ago trying to see if you can interpret angiograms that are recorded through a Google Glass and you had interpreted them on the back end and actually you have decent accuracy for big things like vessel occlusions and dissections. But for CTO PCI, we are probably a little further away from there, but it's coming, so sooner or later. And then the other question is, how do you actually train for this? Do you go through a specific path? Do you like um, practice and then learn on the job? Or do you do a direct training, a so-called complex and high-risk indicated procedure it's called tip training? Do you go straight from, from interventional training to this training, like a structural program, for example? Or do you first practice, get your regular PCI skills um, improved, and then tackle these more complex lesions when you've had this real-world experience? This is something that's being you know, it's very open right now. No one exactly knows what is the best way. You may know that there are 278 graduating interventional cardiologists in the United States every year. So it's a fairly good number. And if you look at the number of, um, uh, of interventionalists who do a TIP, there's only three of them. And we actually almost had one a few years ago, but our fellows revolted. They said, look, we won't do our CTOs ourselves. If you get a TIP fellow, then what are we going to do? So it actually didn't go uh, anywhere. But it, this is something that is discussed, what is the best pathway, and it's uh, still unclear as to what this is going to be. As I mentioned before, the basics are the key. The dual injection, big guides, heparin for decoagulation, equipment to manage complications. Having these simple basic tools increase your success and safety of the procedure. And having everything in a cart and right there also helps you save the time from going back and forth and getting this equipment. Keeping organized is key. So we have one technician in our lab who scrubs in every case. When she's on vacation, I don't do CTOs because you cannot find anything. Once the wires start piling up, it's really, really hard. So, Although, you know, the kid says, I know where everything is, believe me, when you're in a CTO and you have 20 wires sitting around in 10 balloons, it's, it's really hard to tell that. Another important thing for CTOs is the radiation. Maybe less so now with the new systems, the Philips Clarity, but this is from those centers in progress CTOs showing you that there's a lot of variation on how much radiation is being used. Some centers, they all get to 90%, but some use much less radiation than some other centers. So what can you do about that? That's true for every procedure, including CTO procedure, but we now use routinely seven and a half frames in the cath lab, not these 15 frames anymore. And we try to avoid the heavy foot syndrome. This is a syndrome where your foot goes on the pedal and stays there. It doesn't come off. You have to get your foot off the pedal, 
when you don't look at the screen. Sounds simple, I can tell you from personal experience. It's very uncommon for people to be very conscious about the radiation and pressing the pedal. And that can actually make you fail because you're now an hour in and you've used five gray and then the patient is at risk of radiation so you have to stop. So being very thoughtful and very frugal in how much radiation and contrast you use can really help you make this procedure uh, successful. Third component of success is focus. You cannot do CTOs and congenital and peripheral and structural. You know, it's like everything else, you need to focus on something, especially in the early stages. So choosing the area you want to focus is important so that you're more successful. Also, it's important to take your, do your homework. Like everything else, I think more so than any case, CTOs, you need to spend your time, at least 15 minutes of time, with the whole team, the fellows team, the technicians come in. Everyone is looking at the lesion, understanding the, the, the procedure and making a plan. The plan can change, but at least you have a plan before you go in, same way for your climbing, you have a plan, the same way for CTO or PCI. Fourth, you have persistence, so the change. If something doesn't work, don't give up, try something else. There is the fifth component is be creative. And I think CTO PCI is still an art to a large extent. Despite our advances, there is no single thing that does it for everyone. There are many different approaches. The more you know, the better you are off, and you always keep on learning and finding new things. This has actually been very useful to us, um, academically too, which you wouldn't expect. But trying to do these cases, you come up with new ideas that then we publish, and then that also helps you other people learn, and you learn yourself. Just publishing, writing it up helps you uh, understand things very more. The six is to uh, practice and get good at something. And there is clearly a learning curve for CTO PCI. This is the learning curve for three centers. This is from Bill Lombardi and Dimitri Carbagliotti and, uh, and us. And you can see that over time, there is a significant reduction in the contrast we use and a significant reduction in the mean fluoroscopy time. So it does get better over time. At the same time, success goes up. So like everything else, the more you do something, the better it gets. The same, exact same thing we see in NCDR. This is, I showed you before, although success overall was 59%, if you look at the volume and success and, and complications, there is a an, an direct relationship. The more cases you do, the more your success is going to be and the less your complications. So like everything else, it takes practice to get things to happen. Seventh is sometimes you need to push. You know, you do those cases and there's no question. I was discussing with Kleiman earlier on today, had a, couple, a failed case a couple of days ago. You're going to have failures. Even in the best hands, one in 10 is going to fail. And it's going to be traumatic because you'll be spending like five hours and a lot of equipment, a lot of effort, and you'll still be failure. And this is, is uh, not, not, a, not a pleasant experience. Go and explain to the family what happened. So the bottom line is you can look at this and say, I'll never do this again, or say, look, that was a failure. Let's see what went wrong, what can we do different the next time. Get a little push that can help you get up and get on moving. Complications, they're going to happen. CTO PCI, there's no question, it's going to have more complications than your standard type A lesion. I mean, it's common sense and it's in the real life. Every complication that can happen in real PCI can happen for CTO PCI. We just did a survey of more than a thousand interventionalists of what is the complication you are most concerned about. And the number one is perforation tamponade, and number three is mortality. So perforation remains the number one concern, and for good reason. As you know, we're trying to follow a path that is not there, and wires can go out. In general, if your wire goes out only, you're okay. The, you won't going to be perforation. But if your wire goes out, and you don't realize it, and then your microcaster goes out, that's bad. And that's where the big the problems happen. So complications is a reality. And the same thing was seen in open CTO and progress CTO. So in progress CTO, 1% pericardiocentesis. In, progress, in open CTO, 4.9% uh, clinical perforation, meaning something needs to be done. So perforation is an issue. You have to be ready for it. The, the number one group of patients that makes me very nervous about this is the bypass patients, because the perforation there can cause to localize tamponade, because the pericardium has adhesions. And the problem with that is you cannot drain it, because it's not in a specific spot, compressing the, some structure and causing shock sometimes. So extremely careful in previous bypass patients. If something happens, you call the surgeons, try to close the perforation as soon as possible because the localized tamponade can be lethal to the patient. 
How about long term? The news are actually getting better here. The patency, if you get this open, with second generation drug eluting stands is not bad. Um, TLR, TVR is in the 10% range. We had a study, you know, our study was a little higher than that, but for most studies, about 10, between 10 and 15% MACE uh, and TLR over the next two years. And last but not least, the reason you're doing this should be very clear. You're doing this because there's a patient, or there are many patients who need something done to help them go, and that's the why of CTO P uh, PCI. And this is why we do this. For the last three years, before I got this, the, the, uh, the surgery from you guys, it was heavy. But I mean, I thought it was just something that it was just a part of what was happening to me because I knew that I had heart problems, and I knew that I had bypass surgery, and I knew I had steps in my heart. So I just didn't know what the, you know, the results from that would be. That procedure was, to me, a lifesaver. Before I had the procedure, well, I was, I guess I was at my, about my eighth year of having the bypass. My eighth year, I couldn't even put out the trash. I couldn't take a real good walk without taking a, a glycerin pill. But like I said, after having this last procedure that you guys gave me, I can put out the trash, cut the yard, and you know, relax. And, and, and take it easy without really worrying about anything so far. And like I said, I I do appreciate that procedure. That was one thing that I did in my life that I think helped me out a lot. And it's still helping me out. <laughs> so that's why we do this. The number one reason for doing CTO PCI remains the angina, improving symptoms. That's why we do this. You know, in stable CAD, based on courage, you're not going to change the rate of MI, you're not going to change mortality. If, if you might do something like that, it might, it's possible with CTOs, but the reality is you do it for sleep. That's the number one reason, is improve symptoms. Angina, dyspnea, there are many patients who have very severe symptoms, refractory to medical therapy, and these are the ideal ones for, for CTO PCI. It could also have other benefits, improving LV function, potentially if you have a STEMI and you have a CTO that can be worse than if you don't. Sometimes uh, you, you do the treat arrhythmias. And uh, many patients like quality of life, i.e. Uh, Viagra, i.e. Uh, non-nitrates, i.e. Uh, open the CTO. You'll be amazed how often we have this in our, in our VA. And in the current environment, also doing CTO PCI is a good way to do other cases seem very easy. I can tell you yesterday was a poor CTO day. Everyone was very relaxed. We did a bunch of purifications, calcification. Everyone was very relaxed and easy. Because after you do CTOs, everything else feels very, very easy, much, much easier than it did before. You think you're taking a break. So it's always a good thing. This is from OpenCTO. This is from Aaron Grantham. And you can see, again, significant improvement in Seattle Engineer Questionnaire score, clinically significant improvement in quality of life, less dyspnea, less uh, depression. Actually, Farouk Jaffer and Bobby Yeh just published this. So again, many of the patients with, CTO, with CTOs are depressed. And it's those patients, once you open it, they have a significant reduction in their depression and feeling significantly better. So. Maybe it's, not, it's good for many other things we thought of, but the bottom line is having a less engine, a more engine-free living can make you feel better in multiple, in multiple ways. And this is the argument for CTO PCI is patients have engine, they have symptoms, and you can treat the symptoms with medical therapy, and it can work in many patients, but the reality is there is the cause of the symptoms, and treating the cause might actually help improve the symptoms as well. So how many randomized trials do we have for CTO PCI? And this is what it used to be until a few months ago. We had zero. But in TCT, we had the first trial, which is called the EXPLORE trial, that randomized patients who had a STEMI and a non-culprit CTO to either open the CTO within a week or not. And the primary endpoint was EF, and there was absolutely no difference, although success was low at 70% or so. This is a study called Science CTO. This is a study we've designed a couple of years ago. A study to definitely unequivocally say that, look, CTO PCI improves symptoms based on sound control. Um, we tried to get this funding through NIH. They thought it wasn't very innovative. We tried to find it through many avenues, finally launching it through our own, um, our own funding. But that will be the first trial comparing CTO PCI to a sound procedure. Patients come in, they get access, but no opening of the CTO. And, and we'll see how the quality of life is going to be down the line. So we do need randomized control trials, no question about it. 
we have now the expertise, the 90% success that the benefit will be there. We're not done the 60% anymore. And it go, it's going to move the field forward and improve, improve reimbursement as well. There are many other indirect evidence, although we don't have randomized controlled trial data, there are indirect evidence that if you open CTOs, you have less mortality, less maze, less MI, less bypass. This is the double jeopardy idea. If you come in and you have a STEMI and you have a CTO, your mortality is going to be four times higher than if you don't have a CTO, even if you have multivessel disease. And the same things on the meta-analysis. And the other thing is that the number one reason for incomplete revascularization is the presence of a CTO. The number two is calcium. So by opening the CTOs, then you can provide complete revascularization that has been shown again in observational studies, not RCTs, shown to improve, uh, to be, uh, have less mortality down the line. And occasionally you have these patients who come in with refractory arrhythmias, and by revascularizing them, the arrhythmia resolves. Can we make it easier? There are many scores that can help you predict how difficult it's going to be. JCTO is one. We know the more the score, success goes down and the complexity goes up and the need for advanced techniques, eye retrograde and the sexual reentry goes up. This other score we just published, the progress CTO score, we can the same four characteristics, the higher the score, the lower the success rate. So by using the score earlier on, you can select the cases that you're more likely to be successful on. Another thing is these uh, global wars on what is the way to go. Japan says retrograde, Europe says undergrade, and US says the sexual reentry. The good news are we're finally coming to a consensus even among this group. This is from TCT as well, showing that the Asia-Pacific group now is following a very similar algorithm, the hybrid algorithm, trying to use all strategies to successfully recanalize the lesions. And in the end, you may have heard the story of the elephant, but interventional cardiology is not what it used to be. Interventional cardiology used to be type A lesion, more simpler lesions, but over time things have evolved quite a bit. And Sometimes we may be like the elephants who came to the zoo as a, as a baby and they were tied on a pole and they thought they couldn't move because their foot is tied. But now they're a huge elephant. This is not an issue, but they don't even know it, so they don't even try to go. So CTOP is one of those examples where you can go to the next level and do things you can do uh, yeah, in this day and age. And this is an example of why doing CTO cases is similar to getting stranded in Mars. Did I think I was going to die? Yes, absolutely. And that's one you need to know going in because it's going to happen to you. This is space. It does not cooperate. At some point, everything's going to go south on you. Everything's going to go south, and you're going to say, this is it. This is how I end. Now, you can either accept that or you can get to work. That's all it is. You just begin. You do the math, you solve one problem, then you solve the next one, and then the next. And if you solve enough problems, you get to come home. So that's what the OPCI think? is. You solve a problem, solve another problem, and then finally, if you solve enough, you open the artery. And it, it's, it's, as I mentioned before, it's not only useful for CTOs, but for non-CTOs. This is an example of a case, RCA, a couple of lesions, balloon dissection, ST elevation, deliver the stand, everything comes out, the patient's having ST elevation on the table, and just converted a stable CAD patient to a STEMI. Couldn't rewire the vessel, but then we finally took a, a loop, a pilot 200 loop, went back in, re-entered the vessel distally, got it recanalized, everything is solved. So this is an example of how some CTO techniques can help you bail out on some situations when non-CTO lesions went the wrong way. And for the institution, it has that so-called halo effect, that if you do something well, like TAVR, or CTO, or peripheral, or whatever it is, that makes everything look positive and, and helps um, with referrals for other similar things, complex PCIs or complex structural cases. How about the cost? There's no question doing CTO PCI has higher cost, more equipment, more stents. However, if you look at contribution margin, that's again from Dimitri Carbaliotti, that it was about the same as non-CTO PCI. You may say, well, I work twice as hard for this, and that's true, but at least we don't lose money. The institution um, still makes money, so it's not a money losing proposition at this time. Guidelines supported. The, there's a class 2A level of evidence B recommendation for CTO PCI in the US guidelines, and very similar to A level of evidence B in the European guidelines. So, based on the guidelines, um, this is something that is acceptable. And we shouldn't forget, this is from uh, a paper we published last year on the meta analysis on, on all the guideline recommendations. 
if you look at how many of them we do have a level of evidence safe, which is randomized trials, it is only 10%, 11%. So even though we don't have data from RCTs, the patient is in front of us, we have to do something, we do the best we can based on whatever data we have. We still have to generate this data at some point, but for every given time, we do the best we can for the, da for the data we have. So if you start with a vision for CTOPCI, plan carefully, work hard for it, get some little push, you will succeed and be rewarded. And that's true for CTOPCI. You can get really better, but it's not a one-way street. It doesn't mean you do all these things, you get to be successful, and, and that's it. I can tell you this is a very humbling procedure. You can have failures at any stage when you do these cases, so it's a, it's a circle. You never stop learning. You never stop trying to understand better and to get better and get things faster, safer, and more efficient. So in summary, CTOs are common. You can get it done with high success and low complication rates, but that's only in some experience centers, and there's definitely room for growth in other centers. And it does seem to provide clinical benefit, but we definitely need a randomized controlled trial to prove it beyond any doubt. So CTO beside us from Bill Lombardi is a journey, and it's a community that wants you to succeed, get skills, and work collaboratively so we can all improve our techniques and our patients' lives. And I would like to invite you on the journey. Thank you for having me here today, and happy to take any questions. That's an excellent question. So the, the best paper is uh, um, from, uh, from, from, from the managed group. It's published two years ago in European Heart Journal. And it depends on the age of the occlusion. So what they found is the younger the age, you have more fibrotic and less calcium. The older the age of the occlusion, there's more calcification. If you look at the proximal entry into the occlusion, it's much more likely to be blunt than the distal end. That explains why the retrograde approach sometimes works better, because the, the proximal end is calcified and blunt, the distal end remains tapered because of retrograde filling from collaterals. The key components are fibrosis. Again, the older, the less fibrosis, the more calcium, and how blunt, how blunt is the cap. Now, we used to think that are microchannels, and that we get the microchannels and get the wire to go through them. Apparently, that's not true. Apparently, the microchannels are more of a creation than, than, than a reality. The reality is that there is um, the occlusion, and over time, there is more calcium, there is negative remodeling, and you try to find your, your pathway through this, but the, the, the way it affects your procedure is that if it's very calcified and very tortuous, going retrograde is the better way to go. All right. I have a quick question. Uh, great talk. Uh, I was wondering, um, can you comment on the use of CTA to complement uh, CTO intervention? And um, what's your wire escalation strategy? I think that's a great question. So regarding the use of CTA, it's not used very much in the United States. The one group of patients where it's very useful is when you have a very poorly visible distal vessel. So if you don't see the vessel you're going to, you want to see this before you start going to it. So that's where CTA can be very useful. Otherwise, we don't use it as much because the problem is there's no co-registration system. You do it and then it goes overlap with your X-ray and help you guide it. So we don't do it as much, but the one group who definitely is very useful is for the poorly visible distal target vessel. And your second question, the, the wire escalation um, strategy, it's a very personal thing. But for most people, they start with a polymer taper tip wire like a field LXT, and they go to pilot 200 if you, understand, if you don't understand where you're going. That's a polymer heavy tip wire. And if you understand where you're going, go with the Gaia second, which is the wire I saw before, the composite core guide wires. So field LXT first, that's a one minute wire. It's either going to go or be destroyed within a minute. Then you take it out and then go, if you understand the vessel exactly, with the Gaia. If it's still tortuous and clear where exactly the course of the vessel is, uh, pilot to come. So, so, Manos, that was a great talk. Uh, the one thing you didn't hit on, uh, you know, and you told us a little bit about randomized trials, but there's not much there to talk about. Uh, you didn't talk anything about patient selection. So we see lots of patients who have 
really tempting uh, CTOs, nice juicy distal vessels. Of course, they're juicy because they already have good collaterals. Uh, many of these people don't feel too bad. Some do. Uh, how do you select the patients? How symptomatic does someone have to be? How much ischemia do they have to have? Uh, how do you balance the uh, potential benefit versus the difficulty of the case? That's a good question. And that was, I was alluding to that with my slide about the, sim the symptoms. So the number one reason for doing this is the symptoms. Patients are symptomatic. We typically won't touch them unless they have like more than 12, 15% ischemia, large ischemic territory, it's an LAD, and th that's the one group we might consider doing it. The way we talk to the patient is like this. They come in and say, look, I have the symptoms and everything. We tell them, look, 90% success, 3%, 5% complication rate. This is for radiation burn. And how, how limited are you? If you are limited and that bothers you, then we can do it. If you're not, then, you know, maybe medical therapy is not too bad for you. That doesn't help me too much. <laughs> <laughs> well, how, how can we help you more? <laughs> so uh, when we do CTO, uh, the dictum here is if you want to go for medical therapy, we consult Dr. Kleiman and I can tell the patient, look, I've consulted with Dr. Kleiman, medical therapy is good. A lot, <laughs> lot of the patients actually settles down. Uh, thanks again, Melnos, for a great talk. But I'll give you an actual problem that we have the patient right now. A uh, patient, uh, class 3 to 4 uh, angina, uh, Lexus scan, 25% uh, defect, cath, discrete lesions in the RCA and circumflex, and uh, CTO LED. The guy didn't want surgery. He's got his business things to attend to. In fact, he has to go to India for something. Two stents to the circumflex and the right. On metoprolol 100 BID and the IMDR 60, you know, on dual antiplatelet therapy with statin, totally asymptomatic. So his primary uh, cardiologist, who's a non-invasive guy, said, like, you need to do the CTO. I said, like, why? You know, patient is asymptomatic. He said, like, well, think about it. Had I sent the patient to bypass, he would have had lemur and two vein grafts. So now you are compromising yourself, and that's coming from a non-invasive guy to me. So I said, like, look, you got to redo the uh, Lexus scan. And in fact, he did. He's probably not going to get paid because it's within the three months, and now 25% defect is now 15, uh, 12.5. The guy is asymptomatic. What, what would you do? Now the guy knows he's got 12.5% defect. Good question. So uh, it's actually, you're very fortunate because I know here you have one of the best I mean, world labs that quantify ischemia. You know, most labs, we ask them to give us a, a, a number, and it never comes like, it's moderate, it's maybe mild, but you, you guys are very lucky because you have the best, uh, the best lab on this. So there's actually, start, you know, so, uh, so actually Aaron has published this, that the, the cutoff is 11% of, of ischemia. If you have 11% or less, then you don't get benefit from this. And you know, it's a small area of ischemia. The risk outweighs the benefit. If it's 11% or more, then at least in the Mid-America series, the benefit outweighed the, the, the problem. Now, LAD also is another factor in my mind. I mean, mid, I mean, I know it's probably proximal mid, but LAD is a major vessel in, in a presumably young active patient. So in this patient, I think it it would be worth, with a large area of ischemia, even with no significant symptoms, I would see, I would I'll leave to the patient, I would say, look, we can do this, success is 90%, complication is this, I mean, you're young, you have potential to grow for it, can I prove to you that you're going to do better down the line with another myself? No, I cannot. But intuitively, I think it makes sense. Enjoyed your presentation very much. A uh, couple of clinical questions. Um, do you think from the NCDR registry that the percentage of CTO interventions is actually appropriate, meaning that that incidence is actually low, meaning, again, that obviously you see a lot of CTOs, but how clinically relevant would they be for us to intervene on? And uh, it's the rarity as opposed to the majority, right? Because medical therapy has done well, et cetera, et cetera, and the other vessels I'll probably address one way or another, either by, by catheter-based procedures or intervention. So the question to you is, from your experience and the registries, you know, the incidence of us going after CTOs should be in the single digits, most likely, correct? Yeah, so that's an excellent question. Actually, we don't know the number, because we know that 20, 30% of patients have a CTO. But as you said, many of them have three vessel disease go for bypass, or many of them are previous bypass patients, or many of them 
you know, don't want anything done. So it's hard to know exactly how many of them have CTOs that need some intervention and it's done. So Aaron Grantham published this again a couple, uh, I think like three or four years ago, and he said that about 10 to 15% of, of, uh, is a good number. That it should be 10 to 15% is not five. It's like 4.8% uh, of 2013. So the number seems small, and depends on your perspective. Like for interventionists who do CTOs, it seems very small. For people who don't, they may say, oh, that's perfectly fine. So I think you know, it's hard to actually say if the number is the right or wrong. What, what I can tell you is, and that's biased because we see a lot of referrals coming from other places, is that there are patients out there that do have significant symptoms and don't get treated because there's no perception that this is doable or appropriate. And that's, I think, where there's room for improvement. But I think for many of the people who have three vessel disease and CTO, Bypass is the way to go, and, and many of them go for bypass and they get recanalized. And, and the other question to you is from a, obviously we don't have large randomized trials, etc. but right. from your experience and maybe from NCDR is what do you think, uh, are there any data regarding prognosis, meaning patients who still have significant angina or angina with a CTO that either failed an intervention looking at their prognosis versus the ones who who have a CTO open. Uh, just looking at prognosis, et cetera, because um, obviously this procedure has some risk, right? And the question I think would be very important to see what it looks like from the overall prognosis point of view a few years down the line. Are there that's any an, yeah, that's an excellent question. So what you're referring to is, as I mentioned, we don't have randomized trials, but we have the largest meta-analysis on this is actually we did that, 25 studies, 80,000 patients, and fail, it was failed CTO versus successful CTO. That's not the perfect comparison because failed may be a penalty for failing. It's not for sure that actually is the, is the benefit versus the, but the, the curves didn't diverge immediately, which would favor an early penalty, but they slowly diverged. But, but statistically, that's a classic, that's the classic example of a survivor bias. You know, you do better uh, at a CTO, at being opened because your patient is healthier. Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a fraud. It's a, you know, not the perfect comparison. That's all we have. It's not fraud. It's fraud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So watch it there. That ice is really thin. That's right. Quick, quick question. For patients with low EF, because the microcirculation, I mean, how do you have any other way to assess? I mean, if you have... If the patient's having an angina, I think we understand everything's good. If you see a patient with low EF, CTO, do you use any additional techniques, uh, MRI or something else to, to what, how do you approach those patients? Sure. Thank you. Sure, that's a great question. So if you have a patient, you're doing it for low EF essentially, you want to yeah. completely vascularize, the question is, is it viable or not? So if the patient has everything else fixed or open and he's still having angina, we typically don't do a test because having angina to us is surrogate that it's alive. If the patient has dyspnea or some non-specific symptoms, then absolutely we'll do a viability study, you know, typically an MRI, uh, and, um, and see if it's viable. If it's not viable, obviously there's no point in intervening there. So I had a hypothetical patient. I was hoping you could tell me what you would do with this. Let's say you have a diabetic with an EF of 45, and he's got a type A lesion in the right, a type A lesion in the CERC, and he's got a 100% mid-LAD, and there are some collaterals to the LAD. Would you PCI is right, CERC, and fix his CTO, or would you send him for bypass? Well, that's an easy answer. Diabetic, three vessel disease, and CTO, I think it's not even a question. He goes for bypass? Okay, I was, I was just checking where we're at here. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you know, the point is people think that, you know, CTO, PCI is trying to get bypass volume down. I can tell you my biggest referral is a surgeon. It's, it's interesting. People who have you know, indication for bypass, I mean, that's the number one therapy. I mean, why put them through all this? Hi, I just wanted to clarify, because I, I, I'm a little, I, just to make sure we're on the same page. So how do you tell a patient's family who just died that was asymptomatic that you were trying to, who had an asymptomatic patient who you tried a CTO on and they died during the procedure? How do you, I mean, that, cause, I mean that's the real reality there, because you're suggesting that we should open patients who are asymptomatic CTOs. Is that correct with Tut's patient or not? <laughs> okay. I, I, mean, I, I think, you know, I think that's a good, great question, but I think we're missing this conversation doesn't happen after, it happens before. If you do the conversation after, then you miss the boat. 
then it's a major problem. The conversation is before. Before you do this, you have to tell the patient and the family that, look, if you're symptomatic, which is the minority of patients, but you have some of them, and they come in for a large area of ischemia, the discussion is very simple. Look, we have a large area of ischemia. It might help you. It might help you. There's a risk of, you know, 3 4%, and you can even die. I mean, no question. And then if it happens, it's a tragic situation, but it's been discussed before. If you haven't discussed it, and then it happens, I mean, that's a bad. That's a bad thing. So, so just a, so in general, you're suggesting revascularization because there's a potential mortality benefit. As I is mentioned, that, it's is not that... proven. It's not proven. And I say it's the, it's the very minority of patients, like the one you discussed before. I can tell you, I did one on, last two days ago. Patient is like in the mid 50s. He refused bypass. He had three vessel disease, RCA, CERC, and LADCTO. Fixed RCA and CERC. He came back, much better symptoms, but still larger of ischemia and some exertion of dyspnea. We revascularized him a couple of days ago. Can you make an argument? Can you leave him alone? Yes, you can. Can I prove to you that I'm going to improve his survival by opening the LED? A problem? I cannot, I cannot right now based on the data we have. Do I believe it helped the patient? I do believe it helped the patient. Last quick question. Um, when do you stop? Excellent question. That's, that's an area that can be tricky sometimes, especially with referral patients and a lot of expectations and a lot of anxiety. The, the typical rules are five gray, if you haven't crossed in five gray air kerma, typically, or okay, maybe even six, seven, typically you stop on radiation. With the new machines who have a new um, clarity, I rarely go more than three, four, even with 100 minutes of fluoro. So that's becoming less of an issue. Contrast is becoming now more of an issue, where you have you know, more than the contrast limit four times, or um, the GFR, four, 500, you start you know, getting nervous, especially if there's some issue with uh, creatinine. And third, complication. Complication happens in general, you, you call the day and move on. Thank you. Okay, thank you.